All right, welcome back to another Raw Take for CEOs. Getting here to the end of October, mm -hmm. uh, first month of the quarter. Today I'm joined by Corey. Uh, Dan is at the first conference that we have attended since uh, since the pandemic. Yep. Uh, he's, he's down at the Thrival weekend, not mm -hmm. on a weekend, down in South Carolina uh, with some other uh, firm owners talking shop about growing growing the companies. Yeah, it's good to see those back. Those are extremely valuable. I mean, we've been preaching, and actually we're launching another podcast mm -hmm. uh, that it will be focused more on accounting mm -hmm. businesses. And, and, you know, we talk about a lot, a lot about our experience here at Growth Lab and, you know, both in terms of how we've grown the business, what, what marketing means to us. Mm -hmm. um, but more and more, we found ourselves talking to other firm owners. So we will be launching another podcast that will be more focused on the accounting business and keeping here on the Raw Take for CEOs focused on how you run your business and what's important, what we feel is important for all businesses to be thinking about in terms of their uh, their accounting, their their business planning in particular as we go forward. Economic factors, which I think is going to probably be uh, the start of today's podcast, talking a little bit about the economy, things that have been in the headlines yeah, the meat of today will be about the ERTC, and I know that a lot of you have been able to take advantage of the ERTC, but we've gotten a uh, resurgence in questions and interest in the ERTC uh, recently, so just wanted to kind of go through that again. Do another, uh, kind of call it punch on the ERTC in case you have not been able to take advantage of it, or if there's a, a nugget in there that makes you rethink, am I, uh, am I potentially eligible? Because there's a lot of value in it still in 2021, and even some ways that you know you may not know that you're eligible, that you are eligible. So uh, yeah. stay tuned for that, especially if you haven't been able to take advantage of it. It's a lengthy, process to go through it <laughs> detailed it's detailed better better put but it's um there is tremendous value i mean some of our customers have received a lot of a lot of money from it and it's a credit so it's not a loan so it's <laughs> it is a credit people people are getting money money back yeah all right uh yeah Corey. let's just talk about I, it, one of the big headlines is china's economy mm -hmm. I mean, it, it had it showed it grew in q3 mm -hmm. but it grew to the least amount since before 2020 you know, how will that impact us here in the in the States? How will it impact your, your business? You know, th there, there's a few things that are happening right now. There's some, some return to normalcy, Corey. Mm -hmm. But, you know, along with that, you know, we're seeing, uh, you know, one of the things that's more normal is less stimulus. Yeah. And, you know, you have to, we're going to have to deal with the volatility in the market. We're going to have to deal with the issues, kind of call it on our own as we, as we should. I, I think it shows the impact of China's economy on the United States and on businesses over here because... Uh, to put it in context, like a lot of the China's growth is in these double-digit GDP growth numbers. Like it's astronomical growth over the past multiple years since mm -hmm. 2008, right? Yeah. And there's a lot behind that, right, in terms of arguments around uh, developing and developments over there that were spurring GDP growth without actually being utilized, right? So there may have been some different conversation, but I think the point is like contextually, it's the slowest growth, but the baseline is... 10%, 12% mm -hmm. GDP growth. So even for them, 4%, 5% may seem slow, but for any other country, that's still a, a massive growth. So I think the point is, it shows the impact that China's economy actually has on U.S. businesses. Yeah, and I think, you know, like, like ask yourself, like, what, 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 do, what impact will that have on, on, on my business? Mm -hmm. What will it have on the, our broader U.S. economy? And how do I need to adjust and plan for uh, over the next six months? Yeah, and I think a lot of that had to do, so there's many factors, but, you know, from uh, articles in the Wall Street Journal, a lot of it also had to do with a lot of supply chain stuff, right? Uh, slowdown um, in the supply chain between uh, deliveries and ordering. And yeah, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of people expect that their, the supply chain issues are either, you know, dealt with now since we since there's the toilet paper on the shelves, right? Yeah. But, you know, the supply chain issues for, for businesses are, are going to continue. And I think they're, you know, the, the you know, expectations are that they're not going to get back to normal till sometime in probably late 2022, or early 2023. Mm -hmm. And we're going to start to see inflationary pressures from that um, between the fact that people can't get goods, uh, businesses can't get goods to sell to their customers, and also just, I mean, there's there's a, um, I think there's a resurgence of COVID in, in China as well. And what does that mean for factories out there? Mm -hmm. I think we'll see a lot of inflationary pressures. One on consumers, though, kind of uh, connecting the dots there, is gas prices and oil prices. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there's been an increase in demand. You know, the, the, the weather's been, I don't know about where you are, but here in New England, it's been fantastic. I mean, it's almost late October and it was 70 degrees yesterday. Yeah. Uh, people are still out there enjoying being, being out there. There's an increase in demand. Same time, you know, expectations are that oil and gas prices are going to continue to go up for this for this heating season. And that'll, that'll make it, you know, have a big impact on consumers, particularly without government stimulus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're going to have to shoulder this on their own. And that influences your employees, influences their decisions, their needs. Uh, and this is all in the midst of what we talked about the last few weeks within the podcast, in the newsletter, great resignation of 2021. Companies are seeing uh, employees trade up, you know, especially you know, knowledge workers are working from home. They've got the ability to t take jobs, a lot mm -hmm. broader geography, a lot broader range, and therefore, you know, they're taking the opportunity to switch jobs. I think that's an interesting point I hadn't uh, contemplated, though. And go back and listen to that podcast if you haven't, because that's a, a very interesting topic. But especially with some of these inflationary pressures that are not just going to impact businesses, but are going to impact the consumer. Maybe it's not as immediate, but it will impact the consumer at some point, at some level. How does that translate to the employee that it's no longer just about... Not that it ever was, but it's more than just work-life balance, right? That's a huge piece of it, right? But compensation is coming back to the forefront, right? I feel like over the past few years, there's been a big shift towards benefits, right? Work-life balance, benefits, being virtual, the, the sure. softer side of things, right? Yeah. With these inflationary pressures at some level, you need to pay your bills, right? And with with that podcast, go back and listen to it. Like, yeah, no, what we're is seeing... that going to shift, people? Conversations uh, with with uh, yeah, customers. Mm -hmm. They're trying to hire right now, and one in particular, try, you know, trying to hire for a very specific role, senior role, and they've had job offers refused because not because they're offering too little. Mm -hmm. Like they're 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 above market, I would say. But the market, I, I say, they're above market for history, mm -hmm. right? But the market right now is just very very hot, yeah. and uh, people are you know have two, three, four job offers in front of them, it's hard It's hard to hire. Going back to, you know, the pressures on the consumers and therefore the pressures on your employees are gonna go up over the next few months. And they, they've, got, they've got options. And the cost to attract and hire an employee is a lot higher than retaining an employee. Yeah. Just Once again, it goes back to why HR needs to be a core competency of many businesses, your people, right? Definitely. Speaking of people, one way to take advantage of this and kind of help maybe some of that, uh, the burden, at least on the employer side, mm -hmm. obviously everything kind of trickles down, is the ERTC. Can you kind of give us a summary, uh, like a high level to start for those that don't know it? What is the ERTC? Like, what is the, what is the purpose of it? Yeah, ERTC, Employee Retention Tax Credit, or some just refer to it as ERC, Employee Retention Credit. It started out with the PPP, and everybody pretty much opted for the PPP instead of the ERTC because it was more uh, readily mm -hmm. like, uh, understandable. Nobody really paid attention to it until the end of 2020 because at the end of 2020, a whole new kind of act came together. Uh, we had PPP2. It also edited, amended ERTC to make it so that you did not need to be eligible for just PVP or ERTC, but you could be eligible for both. You just could not overlap, double dip between the two programs. But it is a tax credit, so mm -hmm. it's not a loan. It is not a grant. It is a credit to companies for wages paid to employees in a quarter. And a lot of companies have taken advantage of it to their to their credit. The eligibility is you know kind of a few kind of filters of eligibility. If you've been shut down by government mandate, you know by CDC guidelines, you know restaurants, hotels, etc., then you become eligible while you're shut down. Uh, otherwise, it's a it's a reduction in revenue, cash receipts, technically, uh, compared to that quarter compared to 2019. So it kind of takes, goes back to pre-pandemic, says, what's your business as usual? Mm -hmm. And um, if you've had a reduction in your cash receipts of greater than 50% for 2020 or 20% 20 for 2021, you're, you're eligible for the, for the credit. Got it. Okay, I want to dive into a little bit more on some of the, the mechanics of that. But a quick question for clarification for the listeners. It is not, correct me here, but it is not only for businesses that were forced to shut down from the mandate, right? 
Correct. That's maybe one qualification in mm -hmm. terms of uh, the amount you can get, perhaps, or the eligibility. The eligibility. It's not. It, it doesn't make you more or less eligible for a, a greater le less amount. Okay. It's just if you were shut down, your no matter about your your decrease in uh, cash receipts, you can be eligible. Got it. But alternatively, if you weren't shut down, the eligibility is only on your cash receipts. Got it. Okay. And businesses can go back. This is a 2020 credit as well as a 2021 credit, right? So there's. Uh, there's a total thus far of seven quarters eligible. Yeah, so it started with Q2 of 2020. Okay. And you know, in end of 2020, end of 2020, they extended it into 2021 for all quarters of 2021. So yes, there's uh, seven quarters available depending on your eligibility. And uh, even if you drop, even when you drop below the eligibility in a quarter, you are actually eligible for that quarter because you were eligible the prior quarter. It's I almost have a tongue twister every time I try to explain it. As you can see, <laughs> no, there's a lot to it, and that's kind of why we preface it. But but it, it's I think it's worth sticking through to understand it because there's a there's a, a tremendous amount of value in it. Now we're in October of 2021. Are companies able to go back into 2020, say Q2 2020, mm -hmm. and and recapture that? They are yes. Uh, so you can go back and uh, what you would need to do is file a nine. So this is all about, about payroll taxes, right? So it's, uh, you'd have to file a 941X, uh, which is an amended uh, 941 uh, payroll tax return. And you can you can go back in, in time to claim those uh, amounts. God. So what does that paperwork look like for uh, applying for this. So the biggest thing is is uh, most companies have had a PPP mm -hmm. if they've had employees and therefore you cannot double dip between the PPP and the ERTC meaning you can't use that 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 ten dollars that you paid to an employee you can't say I'm gonna ask for a PPP forgiveness for those ten bucks and I'm gonna ask for ERTC credit for those ten bucks uh, for five of those you can ask for uh, PPP Mm -hmm. forgiveness and five you could ask for ERTC so the nuances between the two programs um, is 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 important to look at if you are eligible because you can uh, move things around for a while we were preaching like don't apply for PVP forgiveness just yet wait till the ERC is uh, hashed out so that you can understand how you can maximize the benefit between the two a lot of companies especially our customers took it took it took that advice even if you didn't especially for some companies who have a uh, low dollar PPP, you probably did not have to submit a lot of detail about what you're asking for forgiveness for, and therefore you still have the option to move monies around between what you are designating in your backup paperwork as PPP forgiveness and what you're documenting as ERTC uh, credit. Got it. So there's, from what I'm hearing from you, is there's more math to this than just the, uh, the the cash collections drop. It's really also a function of balancing the most benefit for you, for you based on if you got the PPP and the ERTC because you can, yeah. um, maybe I mean, you don't ask for full forgiveness, right? Correct. On the PPP. You can look at, you can look at what is your maximum benefit. Mm -hmm. um, and most companies tend to get, optimize the forgiveness first of the PPP and then take the rest in ERTC and maybe haircut ERTC uh, just because they don't want that debt on their books. Sure. Um, but yes, you could take it, take the optionality to get some cash uh, from ERC and uh, not take full forgiveness, but maybe okay. maybe we walk a, through like a, yeah. an example comp company. Let's take let's take the forgive the the shutdown, put the, kind of put that off to the side. Sure. But let's just say, because I think it's helpful for people to like uh, dive into the details um, to figure out if, if they are eligible. So in 2020, let's say that you saw you know a big hit in Q2 as as many did. Uh, to cash receipts. Mm -hmm. Companies weren't sure what they were, customers weren't sure what was going to happen, so they held onto the cash, didn't pay you. Big, big reduction, 75% reduction in cash receipts in Q2 2020 compared to Q2 2019. That makes you eligible because the, the, when you when you pass the threshold of uh, more than 50% reduction in cash receipts, you then become eligible. And you, be, you stay eligible until uh, until you go back up in your receipts to uh, less than 20%. So let's say Q2, you had a 75% reduction. Q3, you've got a 50% reduction. Q, Q4, you have a 15% uh, reduction. When you uh, hit that 15% reduction, you fall below the 20%, right? But you're still eligible because it ends the quarter after you uh, you were last eligible. So Q3, you were eligible at a 50% reduction, mm -hmm. uh, or even if you were at a 25% reduction, you would still be eligible. And then Q4, you can still take advantage of it because that's, that's the quarter 
at which the end of, you actually fall out of eligibility. Interesting. And so the eligibility on 2020 and 2021 is roughly the same. The difference is that percentage drop, correct? Correct. So in 2021, you are only eligible uh, if you have had a 20% reduction in that quarter compared again to 2019. So same baseline, 2019 is your baseline. 2019 is your baseline. And so we've had a lot of customers that have kind of come back up to almost par with 2019, you know, 2019. So they're, you know, they're right at that, uh, that 20% uh, reduction. And, you know, they've, they've uh, been eligible for Q1 possibly and Q2 and are falling out for Q3. But it's worth taking a, taking a look at your eligibility because uh, in 2021 in particular, the amount that you're uh, able to ask for as a credit uh, goes up quite a, quite a bit in 2021. Now, with the PPP, there were some limitations on, because this all comes back to people, right? right? It's all payroll, yeah. Um, and so one of the limitations, or one of the uh, maybe filters, if you will, sure. was uh, employee compensation, right? Highly compensated individuals were treated slightly different mm -hmm. in the PPP uh, based on eligibility um, mm -hmm. of benefit. Is that a factor in the ERTC? Not the same. So in 2020, your, your max credit in ERC is 50% of uh, weight of every 10,000 paid to an employee in the year. So it, over Q2, Q3, and Q4 in 2020, you, you, know, you can capture 10,000 per employee mm -hmm. um, for the year. And, and your credit is 50% of that. So your, op, your potential is 5,000, 50% of 10,000 per employee. So it, uh, owners have to be treated a little bit differently, sure. but as a, just a straight up employee, it's 5,000 per employee for the year in 2020. Now, in 2021, the, that goes up dramatically because your credit is 70%, not 50%, wow. and it's of 10,000 per employee per quarter rather than per year. So you've got four quarters, uh, 7,500 per employee per quarter is your p potential uh, credit in 2021. Wow. It's quite significant. Yeah. Interesting. So, so it technically is capped at 120,000, 10,000 sure. per employee per quarter. Um, but their underlying compensation does not impact the calculation. Correct. Now, do these have to be consecutive quarters? What if someone had a great mm -hmm. um, Q4 of 2020 and then it kind of uh, slowed back down? Does it have to be consecutive? Uh, no, it does not. You can become eligible again. If you become ineligible, you have to go b fall below that 20% in 2021 again to sure. become eligible. But yes, it, you know, it, if you fall below that number, uh, you can become eligible again. Wow. So what would you recommend to companies that uh, you know haven't started this process haven't uh, haven't talked to anyone about this but you know want to deem whether or not they're eligible yeah do, do a quick pass of your of your p l um, find out if you are definitely you feel like you're definitely eligible mm -hmm. or definitely ineligible uh, if you're on the on that cusp ask somebody that knows a little more about it or can do a little more analysis of your of your numbers mm -hmm. uh, to see if there's a any any way that you can be eligible because again it, it kind of lags by a quarter sure if you become ineligible in q q1 of 2021 so you had a 15 percent reduction instead of 20 percent reduction mm -hmm. you're still eligible for q1 of 2021 if you were eligible in q4 of 2020 so you can still take advantage of that increased ERTC credit in 20, Q1 2021 mm -hmm. uh, as long as you were eligible in Q4 because your eligibility wow. kind of carries over one quarter, one quarter. beyond when you are, you, you are ineligible. The other advantage of that is you can already know in a quarter whether you're going to be, and it's, we're in the fourth quarter now, so it doesn't mm -hmm. really matter, but earlier in the, in the period, companies would know, at, you know before the quarter even started if they're going to be eligible. Uh, if they're eligible for Q2, they're automatically going to be eligible for Q3. There's, there's a ton of benefit here. It's and, and the other thing I'll throw in there is, is the first step would be take a look at your P&L, look, look at the drops, right? But yeah. the other piece of that is if you were forced to shut down via mandate, mm -hmm. like, take you're a automatically, look. Yeah. automatically eligible automatically. For, for those quarters. Yeah. And so going back to the PPP side of things, where I thought you were going earlier about mm. the wages is, and I, I guess I misspoke. We said it was all about the wages. It's all about the wages and the eligibility. Mm -hmm. um, but PPP, let's not forget, had a lot of non-payroll uh, expenses in there. Yep. Started out uh, at a higher, you had to have more payroll. They brought it down to 60-40, right? You can use 40% of other things uh, to get forgiveness. You only need 60% of it for wages. 
and with the the act at the end of 2020 it mm -hmm. opened up to a larger number of items especially for ppp2 what you could use for those other things right um, even accounting things that's uh, money's spent on accounting as part of the other other stuff that you can ask for uh, in that non-payroll portion of your PPP forgiveness. So a lot of the work that, a big shout out to uh, Ben Marslack on our team. He's our PPP and our ERTC guru. Uh, don't go to any, I don't go to anybody else when I, when I have questions, but he's our guru to make sure that uh, A, we're maximizing, B, we're not overlapping between, between uh, programs. But part of what people have been able to do is take more of that non-payroll stuff put it into PVP forgiveness and take the wages that you're carving out because of that and put mm -hmm. them into ERTC. Good point. goes back to that that balancing act Balance. between the it's, two. It's, don't just apply blindfully looking for the money. Yeah. Take advantage if of If that's it. your case, reach out to us. Um, we're happy to help you, but I can give you the template. You can do it yourself if you can figure it out. Um, I'm not trying to uh, tr not trying to just sell, but we have kind of figured out how to uh, uh, make sure that you're not overlapping. Provide that documentation to your payroll company so that the payroll company can then submit the 941X and get your money credited back. A lot of this comes down to backup documentation. <laughs> it's, it's all, it's all <laughs> right. about keeping that file. Mm. Digital, so digital file. Digital. Paper. Random question that makes me really like, think kind of closing the loop on the beginning of this conversation with kind of the, the news is what is your take, what is your raw take on the PPP or the ERTC? We've had this conversation in the past, but mm -hmm. you know, things transpire, things change. On the ERTC with companies getting this money, right? Rightfully so. There's there's a lot of companies that were negatively affected mm -hmm. horribly from mm -hmm. COVID, right? But that impact on how people are planning for the future, that impact on inflationary pressure. We joke around and we call it free money, but there, there's some truth behind it. How do you feel like that's impacting small businesses going forward in terms of, yeah. You know, I, th I hope, you know, I think people are planning for it. I think they're, they understand it's not going to continue to, to flow. Mm -hmm. The free money is not going to continue to flow, but you know, back when it started flowing, you know, we were talking a lot about Black Monday for mm -hmm. Small Business Black Monday. I think some of our some of our first podcasts were about Small Business Black Monday, and that was the day that the free money did stop flowing, and we started having to pay it back, right? And a lot, lot you know, PPP forgiveness has gotten a lot looser, I'll say, and so we're not seeing that as much. But it still, I think, is very uh, appropriate to look at and say, you know, what is the Small Business Black Monday? And our definition was really when you know, kind of, kind of came to a point where you say, hey, we just got to like survive on our own, right? Mm -hmm. We've got to we've got to take pay back this pay back this money, or in the, now in this case, just kind of go forward without without this stimulus money uh, in hand. But I think it's you know the overall the stimulus money did a great job of keeping the keeping consumers, employees, businesses afloat, uh, and many smart business owners have used that money wisely, mm -hmm. even on the balance sheet. You know, truing up some balance sheet things. But if we don't think hard about what it's going to take to grow in 2022, you're going you're gonna to miss the ball because it's going to be more expensive. It, employers are going to be harder to retain. And, you know, there are going to be business challenges remaining from COVID that are going to even go into 2024. And I, I think that you closed that out well because I think that some of our topics sometimes on the raw take is it seems like we go from the ERTC to GDP, right? The, the goal deployment plan. It's one of our podcasts yeah. a few weeks back. But there's a lot of thought put behind that, right? Because I asked that question because then I go back to your point of if you think you're just going to grow, right? Or if you're not being thoughtful and methodical about it, you're missing the boat. It goes back a few weeks to the GDP, right? Planning. Mm -hmm. it, it, it comes down to like taking a break, pausing and saying, what do I actually need to achieve that growth? What is that mm -hmm. going to take? What are the what are the inputs of it? What are the outputs? What are my risks? What are my opportunities? How am I going to deal with that? The countermeasures? But th there's a theme to all of this. It all comes back to planning. There definitely is. And I think uh, going back to employees, mm -hmm. one thing that has been more front and center this go around in terms of the GDP, what are my goals? How am I going to get there? What resources do I need to get there? Building out a, a long range plan in a 2022 budget. You know, what's come much more front and center in that 2022 budget is your headcount. Yep. Yeah, it's always been important, but um, I've gone through the process with many more customers this year than before in putting together like, here's your current org chart. Mm -hmm. Here's what your org chart looks like at the end of 2022. 
And so here's the positions you need to hire for. Here's about the timeline you need to hire, right? That's always been there, right? But it's uh, I find it that people are paying more attention to it because it's so much harder to hire. And that in and of itself is making people focus more on the people and the resources and how they're going to, to attract and retain them. Before it was just kind of assumed, hey, if I want to hire a director of marketing I'm in February, in I'm going to yeah. put it up in you know January and I'm going to have somebody, mm -hmm. you know, 20 candidates, I'm going to grade it. Now it's more like, crap, uh, if I need a senior level person, I really need to start today. And I, it's no guarantee that I'm going to be able to find somebody that, uh, you know, that to hot to start uh, when I want when I want them to start. Mm -hmm. So I, I've been doing a lot more of that mapping of here's my future state org chart with uh, with customers. Same information, different view. Right. Sometimes yes. that gets it across. Right. This was good. I think this was super helpful. We will include the uh, the template in the show notes, um, as well as we have a, uh, a little templated flow chart to kind of guide you through some of the eligibility. And oh, and last thing on the ERTC, not to get political, but the Infrastructure Act that's kind of hanging out there that you know may not go anywhere. But if that actually does pass, uh, one of the things that is going to be gotten rid of is Q4 ERTC. 2021. 2021. So a way to save save some of that money to put it into infrastructure. So we'll see if that happens. But right now. Q4 is still on the table. Cool. This was good. I think this was super helpful. If anyone has questions about the ERTC, uh, let us know. You'll probably end up talking to Ben. This was great. Cool. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, everyone. See you next week.